The Life of the Mystic of the Third Order of St. Dominic, Venerable Sister Catherine Paluzzi. The strange career of the tertiary Venerable Sister Catherine Paluzzi brought her into contact with a number of saints and sinners. It seems odd that so vivid a character should have been lost in obscurity. Francesca Paluzzi was born in Merlupo, Italy, just north of Rome, on March 7, 1573, to Pietro and Hortensia Giorgi. The second of eight children, she had one brother older than her. Although her parents were poor weavers, they gave their children as good an upbringing as possible. Francesca learned to make herself useful around the house when she was quite young. Playing with the village girls was a chore rather than her desire. Her heart was more at peace alone in the countryside. She found solace in being her father's favorite and his confidant. This relationship became especially troubling for her when at the age of four, she started having visions of Jesus and of the Passion and could not tell him about these. Her first vision happened while she was playing in the company of the other girls in the countryside. Francesca was distant and not engaged with her friends, desiring to be alone with God and his creation. Suddenly, she saw all different creatures come before her, some big, some little, some beautiful, and others ugly. Each one had its own nature, which was unable to change. Instantly, her mind was raised to God, for him to allow her to understand what this vision meant. She heard an inner voice telling her distinctly, Serve God. She replied, I did not know how to do anything, and I wanted to know him so he could teach me. The little girl grew up with her hands busy about many things, and her heart even busier with prayer. Francesca felt a continuous inspiration to become a nun, even though she understood nothing of the vocation of neither nun nor matrimony. What she understood with every fiber of her being was that she was born to be a nun. She tried multiple times to explain her ecstasies to her father, always asking him about how she could avoid hell and enter heaven. She constantly hounded her father to know if it was sufficient enough for her to not say bad things. Was this enough to get to heaven? Her father tried to be respectable and patient, but often at the end of their discussions and her persistent inquiries, he found himself scolding her. The good man lent himself for some time, then tired soon by the frequent interrogations of his daughter, he did away with it one day and gave her a blow. Her mother also scolded her every time she caught her daughter performing any act of penance, heartily trying to rid her daughter of any form of pride and frivolity. Francesca received the blow and her mother's scolding with patience and humility. Misunderstood, Francesca retreated to the corner of her house, nailing in front of an holy image to beg heaven for someone to come and teach her. Perhaps it was this gulf of misunderstanding in her home and the complete lack of solitude that later drew Francesca so close to St. Catherine of Siena, who had suffered similar troubles. Still deeply distressed at not having enough light on the means to acquire eternal life and avoid hell, she redoubled her inquiries in order to obtain the desired clarifications. Unbeknownst to her, God was working gently in her soul. He inspired her with a keen interest in prayer and a great devotion to the rosary. Her devotion was so great when she saw people praying the rosary, she sought them out in order that they could teach her how to pray her beads. She also had a burning desire to suffer for the love of Jesus Christ and was enamored with the worship of the Holy Eucharist. She spent part of her time in the church. It was at this time that she received the gift of tears and her first vision of our Lord, which appeared to her as he was in his flogging. At her uncle's death, Francesca had another mystical vision. She was surrounded by family members who were crying over the loss of her dear uncle. Catherine tried in vain to cry. She wanted to cry for Christ's passion, so her family would think that she was crying for her uncle. I withdrew into a room, away from the body, and tried to cry. I could not. And then I saw a man with his hands tied and whipped all over, and internally I understood that this was Christ, and he was full of infinite beauty, and so I began to cry. Francesca was always seeking to learn about the ways of heaven and how to get there. One day a friend of hers fainted, and Francesca assumed she had gone to paradise. Once her friend had come to, she took her friend to a secret place and tempted her with an apple, in order for her friend to describe to her what heaven was like. Her friend did not know what to tell Francesca, as she had not seen or been anywhere. Francesca thought her friend was being stubborn, and that she just did not want to tell her. After all, was not everyone looking for heaven as consistently as she? 
Secular life held no attraction for her, even though her parents needed her to work and could neither afford a dowry to send her to a convent nor to provide her with a suitable marriage. In order to remedy this, she learned to work on the loom, becoming a fine weaver, contributing to the family's financial support. Her ecstasies were not always heavenly and pleasant. God allowed the devil to tempt Francesca and try her faith. One day while she was praying and asking God how to get to paradise, she vowed to him that she was ready to suffer any great torment for love of God, even to die by fire, sword, or be thrown off a cliff. Suddenly, the devil tempted Francesca with the thought of jumping off a cliff on her own to get to paradise and meet her maker quicker. She rebuked his temptation by telling the devil to be gone, that she would not do this on her own because she would burn in hell and never know how to get to Christ. The laws of God were naturally written on her heart, even though there was no one teaching her her catechism. These temptations were allowed to try her in this manner until around age 10. After this, God allowed her to be filled with a great internal and external torment. The inner torment was the devil's constant cursing and scorning of Jesus Christ, telling her paradise did not really exist and that true paradise was to enjoy this life. He showed her pleasures of vanity, claiming this was true happiness. Externally, the devil would bother her while she slept, picking her up and carrying her away or slapping her. In the daytime, the torments increased especially while she was learning to weave. He would scare her by calling her name. If it was not name-calling, the devil bothered her by coming to scare her in various hideous, monstrous forms. One time, while she was working with her head down, she heard her name called. When she looked up to see who was calling her, there was a black bull staring at her and breathing heavily, darker and more evil than anything she had ever seen. In her autobiography, she said she was scared to death, save only by the living faith that she would find him whom she sought, proved to her by the devil's attempts to deceive her. The next three years, Francesca was tried by a long illness, which the doctors could not figure out, nor were they able to diagnose the fever she experienced. The annoyances of the devil very much troubled her. Day and night, she lay agitated, covering her eyes to try and avoid his appearances or the hideous figures he sent in his stead. At night, it seemed that her bed or her floor was covered with serpents, and when she was well enough to go out and enjoy the countryside during the day, an infinite number seemed to find her. She was not afraid of these serpents, however, as her faith reassured her that these serpents were insignificant, and in her ignorance, she did not fully understand what they were. One day, while she was out, she came across a young man who had studied in Siena and was speaking of St. Catherine of Siena with the townspeople. She stopped to listen and understood that Catherine was a maiden and a saint. At that time, her parish did not speak often of spiritual matters or of the example of the saints. Francesca was so ignorant of these topics that she left this conversation thinking that this glorious St. Catherine was still alive and would surely put her on the right path to serving God. She hoped and prayed that she would cross paths with Catherine of Siena in order to ask her all the questions no one else seemed to have the answers for. Each unfamiliar woman who passed by on the street to her mind could have been Catherine. Her desire to know her and learn from her bore devotion in her soul. It is around this time that her physical penances increased and she became a true devotee of St. Catherine of Siena. Not content to deprive herself of a portion of her food, to meet the necessities of the poor, she prolonged her work in order to increase her alms. She fasted three times a week. Her father, by a rather singular disposition, even added a fourth fast, which she kept with more exactness, as it was a fruit of obedience. She was wearing a hair shirt and an iron belt. How can we explain her austere temperance with the multitude of her occupations? She worked beyond her strength and did not give nature the means to recover and support herself. Her fatigue was continual and her meals puny. It could be said that bread and water, taken sparingly, were her only food. Her mortification with regard to sleep was no less severe. She slept only as much as needed to repair her strength slightly. Accurate in all things, quick to obey, she avoided drawing attention to her way of life in the service of the house. She was very diligent at work and at the same time admirably detached from the advantages she could derive from it. 
May my work, she said, be for your glory, O Lord, and all the merit that is due to me for souls in a state of mortal sin, for me alone sorrow and fatigue. A little girl named Bernadine came to Francesca to learn how to spin and weave linen. She was the first to discover the spirituality of Francesca and to embrace it. Francesca took the opportunity to instruct her companion on the maxims of the Christian life. It was really a beautiful sight to see these two villagers indulging in prayer together, keeping in silence at certain times, talking only about God, and practicing good works. Very soon they were close friends, through penance united in love of God. When they were both about fourteen, Francesca made an attempt to enter the cloister, but she was met with nothing but rebuffs. We cannot get along without you at home, said her father. You can pray here. Her then confessor supported his opinion. He was suspicious of the penances the two girls practiced, and he did not want to allow either of them into the third order. He told Francesca that he thought she was possessed and that all of her visions and heavenly messengers were open to question. God never stopped helping his little Francesca. He had sent her a confessor to guide her like he sent the Magi a star to follow. She still felt lost, and just when all the direction he had given her seemed not to be enough, her first confessor died. Surely, without a guide, she would stray far from the path. So God gave her a new star to follow, just as he had sent a new star to the Magi when they were lost. A priest of distinguished virtue, Father Alessandro Migliacci, was appointed Archpriest of Merlupo in 1588. Father Migliacci brought with him the insights he had learned from his own spiritual director, St. Philip Neri, the Apostle of Rome. Francesca Peluzzi and her companion soon attracted his attention, and due to the prodigies of piety he observed, he admitted them both to Holy Communion. For although she was more than fifteen years old, Francesca, by the negligence of her former director, had not yet made her first Holy Communion. Francesca took Father Migliacci as her father confessor, and was grateful for his concern of the health of her soul. After becoming her confessor, he submitted Francesca to some trials to test the authenticity of her spiritual experiences. Father Migliacci was the one to tell her that St. Catherine of Siena was indeed dead, and having lost all hope of ever speaking with her, she wanted to learn to read in order to learn about St. Catherine's life. At night, she would hold the crucifix and cry out for the Lord to help her. She began to ask her brothers to teach her the letters. She virtually taught herself to read on her own in order to be able to learn of God and of St. Catherine of Siena. It happened that St. Philip Neri came to town and her confessor consulted him about the girls. The saint declared that they should be allowed to daily communion. This was a great concession at the time. Francesca made a resolution to abandon herself entirely to his will and take everything he said as the word of the Holy Ghost, obeying without question. Already she felt something of the transports that brought to the lips of St. Teresa of Avila the impulse of love to suffer or to die. But this attraction for suffering always remained contained within the bounds of a submission to obedience that never fades. Francesca's mother, informed of her practices, demanded that she should not impose any of them without the sanction of obedience. In obedience to her mother, she told her father confessor of the acts of austerity like St. Catherine of Siena she was practicing and wanted to continue to practice. But Father Migliacci told her each time she asked to go pray and report back to him what she prayed for and what she talked to God about. In this manner, he kept her occupied, fearing she was physically too weak for her hair shirts, wearing chains, and sleeping on boards. St. Catherine did not leave her spiritual daughter without guidance. The glorious St. Catherine of Siena, without being seen, spoke to Francesca, giving her new aids and favors, assisting her to flee from vices and acquire the virtues necessary for perfection. St. Catherine told her, Obey your father confessor and do whatever he commands you to do. This is the will of God, and there will be more occasions to mortify yourself internally by a mortification even more pleasing to God than the ones you want to offer. Her father confessor's tests of obedience were thus met with obedience and humility. Any time I had a moment of resentment or impatience or wanted to do my own will, I remembered that this was the hair shirt I had to wear like St. Catherine of Siena. Her devotion to St. Catherine made her want to become a nun of the Dominican order. She went to her father confessor to tell him so that he could help her enter a convent if he thought it was a good idea. She went to her parents and told them not to get in her way for love of God 
and instead to help her in any way they could. They, out of love for Francesca, were moved by what she said, but they were still upset. They never thought that she would give them this displeasure. They thought if she was already in a convent that she would have left to take care of them in their old age. Francesca retorted back that Mother's wool was good, but Mary's was the best. And since she was determined to serve God, she must look out for herself, since no one else would, even if she ended up in Turkey, which in her day was very dangerous. In her autobiography, she admits that her response to her parents was regrettable, because out of charity's sake she should have been more prudent and loving and remain silent. Her confessor did not oppose the idea of her joining a convent but told her that he would agree with whatever decision her father made. Her father thought that Francesca should continue to sanctify herself in the domestic hearth, where the exercise of charity and filial piety would gain her an abundance of merits. This answer, approved by the director, did not, however, make Francesca lose the hope of one day embracing the monastic state and entering the Dominican order. Francesca had received a revelation that she would one day wear the Dominican habit, that she would, in fact, found a community herself. She was told that she had to be a nun like St. Catherine of Siena, but without leaving Merlupo. Through this revelation, she was shown a moon, and over this a rising sun, whose rays shine upon her, especially her heart. She was told she would live in a house with other companions and would have to care for them. To her, this seemed impossible, given the obstacles of taking care of her own family. At first, she feared an illusion, but the light became so complete on this subject that she could not dismiss it. It was destined by God for her to found the monastery itself. The exact spot where the house would be raised was shown to her, and her first companions named by their names. But before seeing the happy outcome of a prophetic vision that was only to be realized thirty years later, what struggles had that servant of God to sustain? Father Migliacci asked the Dominican Reverend Fathers of Minerva, if Francesca could wear the habit of the Third Order of St. Dominic. Since there was no convent of their order nearby, they did not grant her permission to wear the whole habit. Nevertheless, in 1590, they granted her, along with her dear friend Bernadine, permission to wear the scapular of the Third Order of St. Dominic. In spite of the most flattering information of her, she was made to wait two years until they allowed her to take the full Dominican habit. Francesca took the name of Sister Catherine of Jesus and Mary, in honor of St. Catherine of Siena. A short time after this, her mother passed away, and a little while later her father as well. Before her father died, he asked her, out of love of God, to not abandon her siblings, particularly his youngest daughter, whom he was certain would have a bad end if Catherine left her. She kept her promise, and as to her youngest sister, she later was clothed in the habit of St. Dominic as well, and spent her whole life under the loving care of her sister, who was then known as Mother Catherine. She was left to care for her seven siblings at seventeen years old in her father's house, with no means to do so. God knew she had plenty of work to do, but she never lost her desire to serve him. On the eighth day after her father's funeral, Catherine was praying fervently in the church after receiving Holy Communion for the repose of her father's soul. Catherine commended her father's soul to our Lord and St. Catherine. Immediately they took her to the place in purgatory where he was suffering great torments. Her father commended himself to her, begging her to free him from his torments. Catherine begged our Lord and St. Catherine to let her take her father's place and take all the afflictions our Lord was pleased to impose upon her for his release. Our Lord graciously accepted her heroic act of charity, and looked at her father, drawing him toward himself, released him from purgatory at once. At this exact moment, Sister Catherine was back in her pew at the church, tired and full of consolation. Assisted by the Blessed Virgin Mary, this pious young girl managed to maintain this large family with her work, at the same time, she went to work on her religious life of prayer, practicing penance, and drawing from heaven the most rare favors. The priest who was her director was not certain what to make of all of her visions. He thought it best to take advice from St. Philip Neri on the direction he should give to this elite soul. The saint, so experienced in spiritual ways, urged him not to spare her the bread of humiliation and mortification, to neglect her visions, and to require her to maintain them in exact obedience. This rule of conduct was rigorously executed. 
the archpriest of Merlupo had nothing but severity and strictness for Catherine. He treated her as a visionary, described her heavenly favors as a figment of her imagination and delusions and ordered her to disregard them and through prayer to seek to be delivered from them. Catherine, delighted to be treated in this way, thanked her director affectionately and promised to faithfully put his opinions into practice. Catherine begged God to relieve her of the strange manifestations that made her confessor distrust her. They did not cease, and on the contrary, they increased. On Holy Thursday morning, Father Migliacci, after hearing Catherine's confession, asked if she felt ill. Fearing that he would make her take off her hair shirt, her belt of chains, and make her sleep in a bed, she told him that she did not feel bad. Inspired by the Holy Ghost, he told her as a matter of fact that she was not feeling well, and he knew it. He only gave her Holy Communion because it was Holy Week. To further test her, Father Migliacci forbid her to practice penance and to stop all of her disciplines at once. Although it cost her, Catherine submitted. She went home upset, knowing that she should have just told him the truth, and she took off her hair shirt and ended all of her mortifications. I said to myself, I deserve no better response than this, because I should have told him truthfully how I felt. She left her iron chain and her hair shirt, put a mattress on her bed, and renounced her fasts of bread and water. At the same time, the director refused her the reception of the Holy Eucharist on a great day of celebration. Removed to a corner of the church, the humble virgin offered the divine master her humiliation. When an invisible hand miraculously communicated her, as a result of this favor, she tasted for a while the advantage of a gentle tranquility. She also gave Father Migliacci an account of a revelation of the death of St. Philip Neri, which he did not want to believe until the word reached him that the saint actually died in the very place and the exact time prophesied by his penitent. She only knew of the saint by report and had not heard of his death, but was fervently praying for him at the request of the others in the village. After having received communion on the morning of May 26, 1595, there appeared to her a venerable old man dressed as a priest, clothed in white and shining like the sun. He was seated in a chair, and around his chair was a great space covered with diverse ornaments, on which were written in letters of gold the virtues by which this holy old man had most excelled. Around his chair, but below him, she saw a great number of souls of every state and condition, but none of them were so beautiful and resplendent as this old man. He was contemplating the Most Holy Trinity, and these souls were gazing on him. It seemed to her as if they were making a very sweet harmony, like the singing and chanting of the angels, ascribing to him at the same time great glory and honor. She was desirous to know who these souls were, and she thereupon heard a voice tell her that they were the souls of those who had been saved by means of St. Philip Neri. She related this vision to her spiritual director, who made her give him a description of the appearance of the old man, and inquired what age he seemed to be. All which she detailed, the confessor hereupon showed her a portrait of the saint. The instant she saw it, she exclaimed, This is the very same person that I saw in my vision. Years later, in 1610, at the beatification process of St. Philip Neri, Sister Catherine of Jesus and Mary was called in to testify regarding this vision. In another circumstance, she warned Father Migliacci of a serious danger threatening him, just as he was leaving for Rome. In fact, a public sinner of Merlupo, under the blow of excommunication, planned to attack the archpriest that had tried in vain to convert him. He was resolved to assassinate him. To this end, he gathered some bandits and planned to ambush the priest on his way to Rome. But Catherine's warning saved him from the certain death. Father Migliacci took another path and arrived safely at the end of his journey. He remained in the Eternal City for an entire year. During this time, his pious penitent remained on the direction of a poorly educated priest, unable to understand the ways of St. Philip Mary. Faced with the persistence of these extraordinary graces which Catherine received, this priest went to consult Roman theologians, explain the occurrences as he perceived them, and in agreement they decided to withdraw Sister Catherine from daily communion and her long prayers in order to enfold her exclusively in external works. The docile virgin submitted without a word, but neither her assiduity at work nor the domestic embarrassment prevented her from enjoying the favors which heaven gratified her without measure. According to the effects they produced in her soul, 
The tree could be judged by its fruits. This is what the Divine Master himself told her in reassurance, for she still feared the illusion and the wiles of the devil. Her rare humility, her blind obedience showed adequately what spirit truly animated her. In 1599, Catherine went to Rome for three months, urged by her confessor to stay temporarily in the Benedictine monastery of St. Cecilia in Trastevere, where her director's brother, Father Dominic Migliacci, was confessor. In her autobiography, Catherine reports that she was a guest in the monastery of St. Cecilia for a period of three months, during which the Benedictine nuns had continuously urged her to pray for the discovery of their saint, St. Cecilia. But in her modest and humble way, she told them that she did not hear such things in prayer and told them they should try on their own. She soon returned to her hometown of Merlupo. At about this time, Cardinal Sfrandrati, who had met Sister Catherine in Rome, was in need of prayers for his work. He had received the title of the ancient church of St. Cecilia in Rome and wanted the relics of the saints to once again be enshrined there. No one knew where the relics were. Cardinal Sfrandrati wrote to her father confessor, Father Migliacci, to obtain from her the revelation of the martyr's burial place. And she had finally resigned herself to pray for St. Cecilia's relics to be revealed to her, if it be God's holy will. St. Cecilia appeared to her accompanied by St. Catherine of Siena, and had indicated the exact site where her mortal remains were placed with the other holy saints. She wrote the cardinal back with precise directions, telling him where to go for the relics, where to look, how deep to dig, and exactly how the relics would look. Following her directions to the letter, he found St. Cecilia. The body of the martyr was incorrupt, as the sister said it would be. The cardinal forthwith sent help of a substantial sort to help build a new Dominican monastery in Morlupo. The year 1600 opened in Rome the Jubilee year. On the order of her confessor, Catherine went to Rome. She again stayed near St. Cecilia in Trastevere, in a house put at her disposal by Cardinal Sfrandrati, where she found more encouragement. Father Migliacci had her get in touch with a holy and renowned Carmelite, Father Peter of the Mother of God, to whom she went to confession. Her candor and explaining all the grace worked in her soul cast into admiration this venerable religious. He approved the dispositions of her mind reassured her and exhorted her not to oppose the movements of the Holy Ghost. Delighted to hold for a few months under his guidance a soul so pure, the servant of God carefully noted what he remarked most admirable in her life, and thus became her first historian. During her stay at Rome, the pious sister gave proofs of so high a sanctity that Father Peter of the Mother of God wished to reproduce this in other women. He consulted the archpriest of Merlupo and with his approval placed her at the Trinity Hospital where she could talk to the pilgrims who came in for the Jubilee. The Carmelite took a real interest in the mystic who had come so opportunely into his life introducing her to the spirit of St. Teresa of Avila. She on her part carried on her work of counseling and instructing pilgrims of which over a million visited in the Jubilee year. She was entrusted with the care of the women. Catherine did not confine herself to rendering only corporal services. She applied herself above all to instruct them, to arrange the reception of the sacraments for them so they might gain the indulgences of the Jubilee and visit the churches according to the Spirit of the Lord. She was also inserted into a network of important contacts, and her reputation as a mystic attracted the attention of various Roman aristocrats. Her fervor, the unction with which she spoke of the things of God, excited the admiration of everyone. Her fame soon reached the papal court, and her praises were soon on the lips of Pope Clement VIII. The brother of the archpriest of Merlupo, Father Dominic Migliacci, then confessor of the nuns of the monastery of St. Cecilia, suffered in his soul from the lack of regularity that reigned in this house. Knowing of the reputation of the holy tertiary, he resolved to introduce her into the enclosure persuaded that her exemplary life would make a salutary impression on the sisters. The cardinal vicar was consulted and willingly gave permission. This was not met without the opposition of the nuns. The quality of the instrument chosen to reform them was hardly realized. As a matter of fact, this delicate work seemed to require a completely different hand than that of an illiterate villager. 
One cannot imagine all the measures taken in an attempt to stop the stranger on the threshold of the monastery. The cardinal vicar, unmoved by so many hostile attitudes, maintained his decision. He enjoined the superiors of the nuns to desist from their recriminations, and the latter to accept Sister Catherine of Jesus and Mary, and above all, to obey her in all things. From the first day, Sister Catherine understood that the obedience that was going to be given to her would be purely forced. She felt consolation, knowing that in executing the orders of the sovereign pontiff, she was accomplishing the will of God. She rejoiced in suffering for love of Jesus. However, it was not long before a great change in the monastery was noticed. One of the sisters, most opposed to the arrival of Catherine, had made such a stir, she got physically ill. God, who wished to manifest the holiness of his servant Catherine and cure this poor, ulcerated heart, sent the miserable sister into a light coma, during which an admirable vision unfolded before her eyes. Sister Catherine, the humble peasant woman who had been so badly received, was seen radiant like a saint, surrounded by angels and blesseds. At this sight, all her preconceived ideas vanished. The patient woke up and immediately left her cell, came to throw herself at the feet of the servant of God, Sister Catherine, and apologized for all the horrible things she had said and done and promised complete obedience. By example, she led the whole community to do the same. After this, Catherine was able to inspire the nuns with love of retirement and prayer, brought them without much difficulty to renounce certain abuses, and finally succeeded in training them in the practices of regular life. In spite of her care to console the favors she received from above, enough was seen to convince her new companions of the high holiness to which Sister Catherine had arrived. Sister Catherine herself was restless, for she had had another revelation, telling her that it was now time for her to return to Merlupo and begin her foundation. Time, place, and several other vital factors were unpropitious for a foundation. In this poor little town, there was small hope of supporting a second order monastery. Catherine reasoned, I have from heaven the promise that this house will be established. That is enough for me. In fact, nothing was able to distract her from business. She began her work humbly and with great difficulties facing her. In 1602, she, along with four companions, her younger sister, a sister-in-law, an aunt, and her dear friend Bernadine, began to live a common life in her paternal house in Merlupo. With no conveniences of monastic living, they were all given the habit of the third order of St. Dominic, fulfilling St. Catherine's revelation that she would wear her habit in Merlupo. To support themselves, they set up a spinning and weaving business. There were four looms and five sisters. One prayed for an hour while four worked, an utterly simple system. However, she continued to go to Rome almost once a year on pilgrimage to the Holy Stairs and the seven pilgrim churches. She maintained contact with the Roman nobility who sought her advice on their temporal affairs. On the death of Father Migliacci, his successor dedicated a few years to the sisters with real devotion, then placed them under the direction of Father David de Casal of the Dominican Order. This father recognized without difficulty that the holiness of the foundress was well above her fame. There was a new storm brewing when Sister Catherine started her monastery. To some in Merlupo, Sister Catherine was treated as a hypocrite, claiming she pretended to have virtue in order to be able to travel, since it was in no way fitting for a young woman to go so far, especially a religious. By an act of obedience to Father Peter of the Mother of God, Sister Catherine of Jesus and Mary began to write a report of her mystical and ecstatic experiences, including some autobiographical information. In 1610, the Archbishop of Milan, Federico Borromeo, who arrived in Rome for the canonization of his uncle, St. Charles Borromeo, wanted to meet her. Back in Milan, the prelate started a correspondence with Sister Catherine, both confidential and full of esteem. His letters exist still to this day. However, the letters that Sister Catherine wrote to the Archbishop are lost. Sister Catherine knew that without extraordinary purity, it is impossible to converse with God. She had a very great desire for this virtue. One day, when she was praying fervently for it, Jesus appeared to her. Her divine spouse brought with him a heart, conformed in all things to his good pleasure, and worthy to be the temple of such great majesty as his. 
Approaching his servant, he took her own heart from her, and having put in its place the one he brought, he disappeared, leaving Catherine in an abyss of delight. Amongst the most sublime effects produced in her by this new heart were certain outbursts of love. It has happened to me many times, as well as in prayer as out of it, that I have experienced certain sudden and strong feelings of love. Many burning arrows pierced my heart. They left me all on fire, and so inebriated by the desire of uniting myself to God. Supported economically by Cardinals Frondrati, Archbishop Borromeo, and other wealthy Roman families, Sister Catherine tried to give a better place to her small tertiary community. Father Casal, very eager to help her, also collected alms. Over time, she bought a series of buildings in Merlupa with the aim of founding a monastery of enclosure. The work was moving in a good direction when the death of Father David de Casal nearly overturned everything. The demon revived the old calumnies in the village, represented the foundress under the most malicious lies, and finally raised against her the friendly people who had supported her until then. In the midst of these hostile rumors, Count Antimo Orsini, one of the high officials of the town, was bitterly determined to prevent her from setting up a monastery near his castle. He sent a letter to Pope Paul V begging His Holiness to revoke the permission he had already granted. The Pope refused. On February 28, 1620, Pope Paul V granted permission to establish a monastery of secluded Dominicans in Merlupo once the economic impediments were overcome. The Count said, I will beggar myself if necessary, but that fanatic shall never build a monastery in Merlupo. Catherine, hearing of this threat, replied sadly, Indeed, he will beggar himself, but it will not stop me. She proved to be right, for some time later the man killed his own brother in a quarrel, and he was banished from the city penniless. Overthrown by debts, Orsini sold the land to the Borge family in 1613. This event put an end to the obstacles, and the work was immediately seated on a solid foundation. The cloister was named after St. Catherine of Siena. When the monastery was nearly ready, Sister Catherine went to live for some time with the Dominican nuns in Rome in order to study the regular observance. When her own monastery was opened, it followed the pattern of strict observance of the regular monastic life. On April 29, 1620, in the hands of Abbe Crescencio, Sister Catherine of Jesus and Mary made a solemn religious profession, imitated by her companions who had increased in the meantime. She was immediately elected prioress. The office, which is held for three years, was reconfirmed for life with the permission of Rome. She was installed as perpetual prioress in 1620. Sister Catherine never claimed the dowry of the sisters who were not able to supply one. The remainder of the next 25 years of life, Sister Catherine spent in the monastery, distinguished by prayer, work, and penance. God enriched her with a sublime knowledge, which cast into admiration the cardinals and theologians on hearing her talk of the mysteries of religion. Such was the efficiency of her prayers that she infallibly obtained all that she solicited, either for herself or for others. So it was quite natural that many people came to ask for her prayerful intervention. A true daughter of St. Dominic, Sister Catherine spent her sighs and tears day and night for the conversion of sinners. God revealed to her the state of souls, so that she might remedy them with her salutary advice. He also made known to her the crimes which were committed in several places, so that she might appease his justice. The Holy Prioress was honored with the gift of prophecy. She predicted to Lady Mattei Cevoli, matron of one of the noble families of Rome, the birth of a son who would take the habit of St. Dominic. The child indeed entered the order, under the name of Brother Hyacinth. He later became Bishop of St. Mark in Calabria. Bishop Giacinto Cevoli died in the order of sanctity in the year 1651. Catherine knew in advance and announced with all of the details the death of the sovereign pontiffs, Pope Clement VIII and Urban VIII. Her old friend, the Carmelite, who had helped her in Rome, came to her once to tell her he was worried about a band of Carmelite missionaries who had gone to Persia. Catherine reassured him, told him the story of all of their adventures of their journey, and her words were in conformity with the relation written shortly afterwards by these same religious. A niece of Cardinal Varilli, Yielding to worldly concerns, refused to follow her vocation to the religious state. Sister Catherine, while still alive, miraculously appeared to her, approached her for her cowardice, and left her 
so transformed that this young person immediately withdrew to the Sisters of the Monaster of Humility in Rome. In spite of the esteem which so many graces bestowed upon her, Catherine's heart was never filled with pride. She gave God all the honor and all the glory. In order to safeguard herself from the temptation of attributing to herself any glory, she recommended her clients to the saints in heaven, or used a relic to relieve them of the illness. A poor girl suffering from the knee of an incurable disease was instantly delivered from it as soon as the servant of God had kissed her wound. She was also graced with the souls in purgatory, appearing to her to request penances and prayers for their expiation. Her dear friend, Sister Bernadine, spent many years with her in holy rivalry, pushing Catherine towards holy perfection as they both followed their holy father, St. Dominic. After a painful malady born with Christian patience, Sister Bernadine died. Right before her death, she told Sister Catherine that she would not forget her before God, and if he allowed her, she would return to speak to her of spiritual matters pertaining to her own sanctification. Sister Catherine prayed a great deal for the soul of her friend. On the anniversary of the death of Sister Bernadine, Catherine in prayer saw a pit of fire, out of which issued volumes of smoke and flames. Then she saw a form coming out of the pit. As the vapors dispersed, the apparition became radiant with extraordinary brilliance. In this glorified person, Catherine recognized Sister Bernadine and ran towards her. Is it you, my dearest sister? From whence do you come? Does your purgatory end only today? You are right, replied the soul. For a year I have been detained in the place of expiation, and today for the first time I shall enter heaven. As regards yourself, persevere in your holy exercises. Continue to be charitable and merciful, and you will obtain mercy. Sister Catherine of Jesus and Mary was graced with certain extraordinary phenomena in her spiritual life. She had contact with the side of Christ, and her exchange of hearts was constantly at the center of Sister Catherine's meditations, especially in her devotion to Jesus' childhood and his passion. She often would go into ecstasy, meditating on the holy wound in Christ's side, revealing his sacred heart. Sister Catherine was devoted to the Eucharist. In addition to St. Catherine and St. Cecilia appearing to her, St. Teresa of Avila appeared to her on several occasions. She preached to her sisters for the last 25 years of her life. Oftentimes when she visited Rome, she would be found in the choir of St. Cecilia in Trastevere, often with cardinals and clergy in attendance. Sister Catherine's preaching took the theme of the Gospels or the Divine Office, especially on the saints' days or feasts of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Her preaching always moved those present to tears, giving them much edification. A prompt and blind obedience accompanied the humility of Sister Catherine. There was nothing too low or painful that she did not perform with joy. Thus, by this means, she gained an easy triumph over the traps of the devil. The attacks of hell, the most violent temptations, failed before this truly humble and obedient soul. The same day, she felt very violent evils, which reduced her to the end. She wanted to follow the community again. The devil often tried to keep her from praying, and sometimes he pushed her or hit her. At Christmas, she appeared in the choir, although on entering, she received a terrible blow from the devil, which broke her kneecap. Like St. Anthony of Egypt, she made fun of her enemy and preserved an unalterable calm under his blows. Her gift of prophecy remained with her all her life. At the end of the year 1643, Sister Catherine saw our Lord present her a heavy cross. It was the prophetic announcement of the supreme sufferings, which would put the seal on her patience and finish beautifying her crown. She told her community exactly when she would die, and her prophecy was accurate. On October 19, 1645, she received the last sacraments. After the prayers recommending her soul, she had the Passion of the Savior read to her. When we came to the words, Dum imisit spiritum, he gave up the ghost, she smiled at her daughters and rested in the Lord at the age of 72. As soon as she had expired, her face took on an extraordinary brilliance. Twenty-nine hours after her death, at the request of a few lords, especially Marquis Francesco Crescenzi, the corpse was autopsied by Marco Antonio Albani. The surgeon extracted the heart from her body. At the first incision of the knife, a fresh, ruddy blood came out. The heart bore two deep wounds. 
one of which seemed to have been made by an arrow and the other by a lance. An external contusion corresponded to this wound. Furthermore, the bruises and signs of the holy stigmata were seen on her hands and feet. Doubt was not possible. Sister Catherine Paluzzi had been honored with the stigmata of Christ, which she kept hidden from all but her confessor. Catherine's mortal remains were placed in the wall, separating the church from the cloister. It was ordered that her heart should be placed by itself in a casket. Later on, in 1921, as bright lights were visible at night, the diocesan bishop, Monsignor Luigi Maria Olivares, carried out an investigation on her mystical body, which was found intact and flexible, exhaling a sweet smell. The bishop had the tomb opened and ordered the venerable body to be placed in a more prominent place in the monastery church near the high altar. Unfortunately, due to the decline in religious vocations after Second Vatican Council, the monastery was sold in the 1980s to an architect and converted into apartments. The church remains intact. The reputation of holiness attached to the name of Catherine Paluzzi during her lifetime took considerable proportions after her death, and Pope Innocent X wanted the local ordinary to proceed without delay to the preparatory legal inquiry on the life, the acts, the virtues, and the miracles of this servant of God. The Bishop of Nepi hastened to obey, but he had to stop for lack of money to pay the cost of the proceedings. Under Pope Gregory XVI, the cause was resumed in 1840. Finally, in the year 1862, at the urging of Father Jandel, General of the Dominicans, the Most Reverend Altieri, acting in the place of Cardinal Ferretti, reporter of the same cause, posed to the Sacred Congregations of Rites in a session held at the Vatican on September 25th the following. Is it appropriate to sign the order to introduce the cause of the Servant of God, Sister Catherine Paluzzi, in the case and for the effect in question? After mature examination and after hearing the death of Father R. Marie Fratrini, promoter of the faith, the Sacred Congregation pronounced itself an affirmative at the pleasure of His Holiness. On September 30th, 1862, the Sovereign Pontiff Pius IX, ratifying the sentence of the Sacred Congregation of Rites, signed his own commission to introduce the cause of the Servant of God. From then on, Sister Catherine Paluzzi enjoyed the title of Venerable. The following is a description of the conduct of life a Dominican tertiary must lead. The conduct of the Third Order Dominican tertiaries ought to not only be irreproachable but also edifying so that their behavior may be a patent to their neighbor. They must be very particular in fulfilling all the commandments of God and of his church, and in complying faithfully with all the duties of their state of life, avoiding as far as possible even venial transgressions. They must have constantly before their mind that their order was instituted for the defense of the Catholic faith. Hence, it is incumbent on them not only to receive without hesitation all the decisions of the church, but also to assist earnestly in the propagation of the true faith and in the destruction of error by prayer and by other means at their disposal. Hence, whenever requested by their pastors, they shall assist them in imparting catechal instructions to the children and in promoting other works of piety. Far from declining such sacred trust, so much in accordance with the spirit of St. Dominic, they ought rather to gladly offer themselves for such services and discharge them with great zeal and charity. Her vocation was her greatest accomplishment and her only concern. Visited by continuous ecstasies and visions at the same time terrified by the prospect of being misled by the devil, Sister Catherine's patience, charity, and humility were exceptional gifts accompanied with a rare balance of great modesty. Venerable Sister Catherine Paluzzi had the conduct becoming of a faithful servant of God and a courageous daughter of St. Dominic. Music